James River, this is for you from Buford Road, from the village, from Robius Hall. We celebrate with you right now today. Praise be to God. God is good and all the time. This is an incredible day for Bonaire as one church celebrating this grand opening with James River. And we certainly want them to know we are with them today. And kudos to all, too many uh, to name, who have sacrificed uh, from just in all kinds of ways over these years to making this possible. And so we uh, join together as one church excited to see what God is going to do in the future for them. Greetings to you as we continue now in our series of great beliefs of the Christian faith. It was time for Dennis the menace to be put to bed. So his mom said, Dennis, it's time for you to say your prayers. But mom, I don't know what to say. She said, it's okay, honey. God understands our words. And sometimes he is already praying the words we need to hear. And he said, oh, okay. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. Dennis, Dennis, what are you doing? He said, Mom, I'm saying my ABCs. God will take the letters and put them into the words he wants to hear. <laughs> I love that story. So much truth to that in so many ways. I don't know about you, but I run into people all the time, including myself, who really don't think we're hitting on all cylinders when it comes to prayer. I don't know about you, Webster Dictionary says prayer is a petition to God from the Latin form precaria, which means to ask earnestly, to beg, to entreat, if you will. It's an invocation, almost an act of worship that seeks to activate a rapport, a back and forth between an object of worship. Now for us, that is God as we communicate. And prayer comes in all kinds of forms and and many different kinds of religious practices. It may either be individual or done corporately together. It can be done in public or it can be done in private. It can use words or a song or music or silence. It may involve any of those, if you will. And when language is used, prayer may take the form of a hymn or a, an incantation, a formal creedal statement that may be read like the Apostles' Creed or just a spontaneous utterance of words from someone who needs to connect in prayer. Different forms of prayer, supplication. Uh, there's form, uh, prayers of petition. There's prayers of thanksgiving. There's prayers of praise. What would you say if somebody looked at you and said, so what do you believe about prayer? I, my guess would be we'd also, I believe in prayer. Prayer works. Prayer's a powerful way of me connecting with God. I believe in prayer. Yes, all of that would be true, but let's go just a little bit deeper into this. It's the latest craze in our society right now from the award-winning creators, as you know, of Fireproof and of Courageous. There is, and I quote, a compelling drama called War Room. It has in it humor and heart that expresses the power that prayer can have on marriages, parenting, careers, friendship, and really every other area of life. And a portion of this film, which I recently saw, really introduces a very important starting point when it comes to prayer. Watch with me. This film is about the power of prayer and the necessity of prayer in our lives. It's what opens up the floodgates for God to come down and be involved in our everyday circumstances. Most of us have something of a financial strategy, an education strategy for our children, maybe even a health strategy. To win any battle, you've got to have the right strategy and the right resources. But oftentimes when it comes to prayer, it's a wish to the wind. A lot of people don't pray because they don't believe it works. But unfortunately, it doesn't work because we don't really pray. God calls us to a much deeper level of faith. He has us fight not human flesh and blood, but fight the war that is in the heavenlies. That can only happen from our knees. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, when you pray, 
go into your inner room, in your secret place. We seek God first before going to war, if you will. That verse and that passage is one of the keys to this movie. It's really easy to make prayer an afterthought. We want people uh, to begin to fight their battles in prayer first. So if I was to ask what your prayer life was like, would you say it was hot or cold? I don't know that I would say it's hot. I mean, we're like most people. We have busy lives. We work. <laughs> but I would consider myself a spiritual person. I hope you hear this in the first portion of this movie. The first thing I would want to share with somebody about prayer is that it is a decision. It doesn't just happen. You heard in there that it requires a strategy, a plan, if you will, to be deliberate about this, to meet with God on a regular basis and to pray. You note in our scripture today, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. He didn't just happen along and then have an urge to pray. No, he had a plan. He went to this place at a certain time and he sat down and he prayed. And it reminds me that one of our biggest issues, I think, in our trying to be good disciples with Christ is that we wait on a feeling to get in touch with God, as was beautifully shown in, the, in, in this earth skit. It's just, a, 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 it, it, a, it appears to me that sometimes we just think it's just going to happen on its own, and yet it doesn't. What Jesus indicates by going to a certain time and a place is that he's a man of a habit. He's got a pattern in his life. He goes to uh, this particular place at a certain time and there he communes with his father in order that he might pray. The prayer doesn't just happen for Jesus any more than it's just going to happen for you or for me. It's the result of a decision, a plan, a strategy. It's like everything else in life. We plan to do things. We have a strategy. I, I'm going to go to college in order to get a degree so that I might earn a living in this particular arena. I'm going to uh, go to work. I've decided to go to work and to do what's necessary to find a job and a career in this particular place so that I can make a living for myself. I, I've decided I'm going to marry this woman and spend the rest of my life. These things don't just happen. We make plans and we are deliberate about this. The direction and the course of our lives, for the most part, come about as a result of decisions that you and I make to implement. It's a strategy we have. And so I want to say to you first, having a prayer life is no accident. It takes time. It takes commitment. We've got to have a plan. We've got to have a strategy. And then people will weigh in, well, now, um, how long does that need to be every day? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Some would say, oh, no, 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 no. Anything less than an hour doesn't count. And then there are others who quote the scripture, you must pray without ceasing. So that's all day long in every breath and every thought you're praying. Look, here's what I would say to you. Just make a commitment to go to a certain time in a certain place and spend time with God. And it will not just happen. It cannot be based on just a feeling. Building a strong prayer life takes this kind of commitment and time. It's not something we grab on the run. Too often in life, I think we kind of base our prayer life on a on the sitcom society in which we are. You know, you turn on the sitcom and it introduces the characters and there's a certain problem and then a solution and everything's fine and dandy at the end of 30 minutes. And we kind of treat our prayer like that. Okay, God, I'm here now and I need to introduce to you what the issue is and you're going to fix it. Amen. <laughs> or perhaps we turn to what I call fast food praying using the mottos of fast food chains. We come to our prayer life with Burger King and we say, have it my way. Or my way right away. Or Wendy's who says you can build it 365 ways. A burger built 365 ways. But it occurs to me that that's how many days there are in a year. What about a prayer that I can build my way 365 days a year? McDonald's comes along and teaches us what? While you're ordering, upsize it. And so when we're praying our prayers, then we just say, and oh, by the way, could you just layer just another little blessing right on top of this. I want to remind us that prayer as Jesus modeled it for his disciples, for you, for me, requires a decision, a time, a commitment, a place. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. If you notice what happened next, and when he was finished, the disciples came to him. I love that passage, when he was finished. They didn't bother him, they didn't interrupt him. 
And you're like saying, well, yeah, welcome to my world. My whole world is full of interruptions. They will not wait on me. They may not wait on you forever, but they will wait on you. If the Lord your God is your God, the world not only can wait, it must wait. (coughs) This is where we get into the priority. And so when he finished, they came to him and said, Oh, teach us. Teach us how to pray. So moving beyond this strategy, this plan of knowing that there's got to be a commitment to a time and a place, then what do we do once we hit there? What do we do once we get there? And so we enter into what's known affectionately as the Lord's Prayer. Divided into two portions, really. The first portion of the prayer deals with God. It deals directly with God. Not the praying person, not me, but it begins with God. So the beginning of the prayer must be God-centered, not self-centered. The prayer begins with who God is, not what I need. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. All of it about God. All of it about God because when you and I finally come to that place where we stop and make this commitment of time and place to God, we need to start with who He is and who we're not. He is God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the potter, we are the clay. And so He's the Redeemer, we're the redeemed. And so we get this relationship right in proportion as we begin this conversation with him, talking about who God is. Now, I don't know about you because my natural default is I just jump right in. Lord, I need. Lord, I want. Lord, would you guide me? Lord, would you give me? Lord, would you take me? Lord, Lord, Lord. And there's sometimes I'm wondering if he's not sitting there thinking, am I Lord really to you? Really? Why don't you start with me? Not because God needs it, but because we need it. I need to be recognizing the God that I'm calling upon. And so I begin with God. The second portion of that obviously deals with the life of where you and I are living. It's very much concerned with the world we live in. You hear that. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, provide for us the things that fill us and and, and give us strength and nourishment and clothes on our back and food in our bellies and shelter over our head and relationships in which we can love and be loved and on and on and on, just life. Now, many of us, if you're like me, would like to stop that prayer right there because the next few lines take us to places we're not real hep on getting to quickly because the first one is, and forgive us, our trespasses. Forgive us of our sins. So there is within this prayer a call to confession. Telling it all. Saying it. Putting into words. Now you know there's all kinds of books being written today. Whatever happened to sin? We don't call it sin. We say, well, I made made a mistake. I had an error in judgment. I messed up, but it'll be okay. God calls it Sin. It is missing the mark. It is falling short. It's not attaining that place of that person he wants and desires for you and for me to be and empowers us to be. But friends, we've got to call it what it is. We have to confess it and say, Father, forgive me for this sin. This this one I'm going to name. It's going to come out of my mouth about my life and how I messed up. Because the equation for that is, forgive me as I forgive others. Let's take a vote. Let's take this part out of the prayer. Anybody want to take this part out of the prayer? (laughs) Which means I have to give up my grudge. I have to give up my bitterness. I was pastoring my first church and had a a run-in with a, a deacon who just didn't want to get on board with the vision of the church. And he pretty much just dismantled the vision and me in the process. It was early, early on. Happened on a Wednesday night. On Friday, I was mowing my grass. You talk about mowing the grass. (laughs) Shearing the grass. 
Well, that was an interesting day for me. I felt so much better after I got out there, and I just told him off. Every time I'd mow a strip, I'd just think, take that. What an interesting thing happened. Do you know every Friday after that, for the next eight years I lived in that house, every Friday when I mowed, guess who I thought of? It was like automatic. It finally dawned on me, what are you doing? You didn't invite him to come mow. But he's here and he's eating you up. He's died and gone to heaven. And there I am creating my own hell through my bitterness, through that which I had not really forgiven. Lead us not into temptation. It's everywhere. Now, I know we like to kid ourselves and say, oh, no, I got this. I got this. And so we go through life and we, we act like we can't fall or we're not going to let ourselves get in trouble. And then, boom, before we know it, we're in trouble. And we have fallen into evil. Folks, that's why this movie about prayer is called The War Room, is that there is a need for you and I to do battle, to come before God, recognize who He is, and then bring who we are with our daily needs and get before Him. Because we need to be reminded we don't have to do this life on our own. We don't have to carry the world on our shoulders. We don't have to, to fight the battles on our own. We are not alone. Prayer is a decision beginning with who God is. Recognizing who we're not and then bringing who we are before Him. And then this last portion, which again is one I would just rather skip, but it is so true. And that is often our default is when we talk about prayer and what it is, we say, oh, that's talking to God. We got that down pat. We talk at Him all day long. But then I'm reminded there is this other portion about a conversation in which we are called to listen. Two ears, one mouth. Interesting equation. Perhaps we are called to do more of one than the other. Be still, he said, and know that I'm God. So I'm in seminary. I'm cooking along with classes and sign up for a spiritual development class. Have to take one. And I thought, this ought to be good. We'll learn about the disciplines of the faith. And so Dr. Bill Clemens handed out the syllabus that day. I don't know about you, but I detest syllabus days. Can I get a witness? I mean, it, this, is what you're, this is all the stuff you're not going to complete. Here it is, all on one page. <laughs> but come help yourself. And so I look down and I'm reading the syllabus. And so one of the first things I come to is it says, uh, thou, you will, <laughs> thou shalt. It wasn't a thou shalt, even if it was <laughs> seminary. You shall fulfill a requirement in this class to go away on a three-day spiritual retreat in a monastery. Next sentence. This three-day retreat shall be held in silence. There shall only be talking aloud during meals. And I thought to myself, shoot me now. <laughs> You're kidding me. So... <clears throat> I chose a monastery in Oxford, North Carolina. I'm driving to the monastery, and I thought, listen, I'll just go ahead and practice my spiritual discipline right now. I'm going to start praying. Lord, please come quickly so I do not have to go do this three days of silence. Please. Three days? Try to get three hours. Maybe three minutes. And so I show up. It's a compound. And there are these little cottages. It's a five by five. There's room for a bed and a desk. And there's a toilet and a sink and that's it. Did I say that's it? I mean that's it. So I walk in and I've got everything they would allow me to bring. A pen, and paper, and my Bible. And I sat down and I thought, well, three days. That's the first 10 seconds. <laughs> so I started to read. I read the scripture and I, I thought, well, I've got this pen and paper. I'll reflect on what it says to me. That's spiritual. And I prayed. I prayed. And so when I finished all that, I, that was 30 minutes. <laughs> I thought, well, let's do it again. So I, I read some more and I wrote some more and I prayed some more and then I took a nap. I was tired. 
And I got up and again, and I felt better. I was refreshed. And so I read some more and I wrote some more and I prayed some more. And I did this two or three more times. And then I just got to tell you, all of a sudden it happened. I just stopped. And I just sat there. And it was like the voice of the Holy Spirit. Not audible, but it was almost as if I could hear God saying, you done now? You done trying to fill the seconds, the minutes, and the hours with all your words? You done? Good. Now sit back and listen. Listen to me, Tom. Words cannot describe to you what happened. I can't, I can't even begin to articulate it. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit and His presence like I've never had before. So I learned from that. My second experience came out of the second class assignment on the syllabus that I was required to set up an appointment a week with a spiritual director in Raleigh. So to drive to Raleigh 30 minutes and to meet with a spiritual director for an hour. I chose a Catholic priest. I got to the diocese and I went to the place where he told me to go and it was an octagonal shaped building and it was kind of dim and dark on the inside even though there were windows all the way around it. It was a cold, hard slate floor and two of the most uncomfortable chairs you've ever seen sitting in the middle of the room facing each other. I can take a cue. I go sit down in one. He walks in. He introduces himself. I'm Father such and such. And I said, I'm Tom Stocks. And he sits down and he asks a question. A question that would haunt me from that day till this. Well, not really haunt, but it has stuck with me. He looked at me and he said, so Tom, let me ask you a question. What's God saying to you these days? I'm sorry, what? What's God saying to you these days? Well, my mind started racing. I thought, okay, he didn't ask about my conversion. He didn't ask about seminary, my call to seminary. He didn't ask about, you know, what are you learning at seminary? He didn't ask about what are you going to do after seminary. No, he looked at me and he said, what is God saying to you these days? I didn't know what to say. Because it dawned on me, I hadn't been listening. So let me ask you, what's God saying to you these days? <coughs> no, no, I don't want to hear about your conversion. I don't want to hear about what he did two weeks ago. What's he doing right now in your life? Prayer doesn't just happen. We make a decision to meet with God, to recognize who He is, how much we need Him, and then petition Him for this world in which we live. And then maybe the hardest work of all, to be still and know that He is God. So will you pray with me? You are God. You are Father. You are Creator. Thank you, God, for who you are. I come before you and confess, Father, in half humor, but really in reality, for one who came into this world talking. 
I haven't done a good job of listening. The silence is deafening to me. The silence is painful to me. And I guess if truth be known, since we're confessing, it frightens me. Because it dawns on me, if I can listen to me, then I don't have to hear you. Father, forgive me. And for every person sitting in a community of faith at this moment, oh God, may you be heard. And may each of us respond. There may be one right now who is being nudged by your Holy Spirit to come and say, I love Jesus and what he's done for me and I want to follow him. There may be others who say today is the day I want to celebrate finding a community of faith where God can teach me, grow me, equip me, and I can learn to serve Him. That's what the Spirit's saying to you today if you're listening. My goodness, there may even be one whom the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to come give me your whole life in Christian vocation. I'm calling you out to come be a leader. I pray we hear you, Lord, and respond.